And a very good morning to you once again. It's great to be able to share the Word of God with you in this way. Well, we're going to continue our Bible narratives that we've been looking at for the last number of weeks. And today we've arrived at the story about Sodom and Gomorrah that we can find in Genesis chapter 19. Now, as you know, Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, the very names are virtually synonymous with evil and sin and judgment. So, a little bit of background up to this point. The cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were first mentioned in Genesis chapter 10 verse 19. Then in Genesis 13, we see Abram and his nephew Lot. Remember, they'd been traveling together. Their crops, flocks rather, got too big, and their herdsmen were arguing. So Abram said to Lot, you decide to go which way you want to. You go that way, I'll go that way. You go that way, I'll go that way. And that's exactly what happened. Lot decided to head down towards the plains of Sodom. And that's where he settled. Then in Genesis 13, 13, we read, Now the men of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. Then in Genesis 18, after the three visitors, remember, God shares his plan to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and several surrounding cities. Uh, he shares that with Abraham. Then we find Abraham pleading with the Lord, knowing of his goodness and mercy, and he asked God if he would destroy the city for 50, if 50 righteous people could be found. And God says no, and then he begins a bargaining process. And he says, how about 45, and then it's 40, and then it's 30, and he goes all the way down to 10. And God says no, he won't destroy the city if 10 righteous people can be found. Now obviously Abraham's motivation for this might have been that uh, Lot, his nephew by this stage, was living in Sodom. The city's wickedness had been going on for some time. We read that the outcry caused by these people's sinfulness had become great, indicating that an amount of time had transpired while the judgment was being built up against them. So we can see this delay as an act of mercy on God's part. Or maybe by giving them more time, God expected Lot, the Bible tells us was a righteous man, to be influenced, to be an influence rather, on his society, which clearly he did not. So Genesis chapter 19 verse 1 to 29 then is the story about Sodom and Gomorrah and them getting taken out into safety. And I'm not going to read that now just for time, and I encourage you to go and to read that, Genesis 29 from verse 1. But a quick overview. So the angels, those two men, two of the three, remember there were three men with Abram, two of the three moved, carried on to um, Sodom, and they arrive at Sodom in the evening. Lot, who's sitting there at the gate, convinces the angels to spend the night at his house instead of their original plan to spend the night in the town square. The incredible wickedness of the men of Sodom is then revealed. The Bible declares every last man, young and old, surrounded Lot's house in order to have homosexual relations with the two angels. So the perversion of the inhabitants of sodomy is really, of Sodom really, is where the term sodomy comes from. That's where we get it from. So in order to distract the evil sodomites from their perverted quest, Lot offers his daughters to the men as substitutes. And that's another whole story on its own. Then we see the sodomites refusing and attempting to force their way into Lot's home. The angels blind the men so they can't find the door. And then the angels tell Lot to gather his family in order to flee the city because it would soon be destroyed. Lot's future sons-in-law were not interested, but God saves Lot, Lot's wife, and his two daughters. The angels lead them safely out of the city with the instruction they were not to look back. Lot's wife did look back, and we read in verse 26 in chapter 19, she was turned into a pillar of salt. Another story completely, but just displaying the fact that, that disobeying God always reaps dire consequences. So lots of lessons there too. Anyway, once Lot's family was out of Sodom, the Lord reigned, the Bible says, burning sulfur or sulfur of fire, sulfur and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah destroying all inhabitants and everything that grew on the ground. 
So that's the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And today I want to talk a bit about the sins of Sodom and perhaps some of the lessons that we can learn from those things. Firstly, and very obviously, we see the sin of the perversion of God's intention for a man and for a woman. And included in this is the, the concept of lust and potential rape which would have ensued. But there are some other issues at play here. In pronouncing judgment on Jerusalem and Judah, Isaiah says in chapter 3 verse 9, The look on their faces testifies against them. They parade their sin like Sodom. They do not hide it. So we see an abundance of pride and arrogance also in the Sodom story. Reminds me of some of the, the pride marches that we see even today, or especially today. Furthermore, Ezekiel gives us further insight into what was actually happening in Sodom. Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 49, 50 says, Now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. They were haughty, and detestable things were done before me. Therefore I did away with them, as you have seen. Now in the Midrash, which is an ancient commentary on the Bible by Jewish scholars, we find an interesting story about Sodom and what transpired there. The story goes, there was an incident concerning two young girls who went down to fill pitchers with water from the spring. One of them said to her friend, why is your face so sickly? The other said to her, our food is all gone and we are about to die. What did the first one do? She filled her pitcher with flour and switched the two, each girl taking what was in the hand of the other. When the people of Sodom became aware of this, they took her and burned her. That's the good one, the kind one, the compassionate one. So the Midrash paints a terrible picture. A young woman burned to death as punishment for an act of compassion. And her burning was not the work of hooligans. She was tried and convicted under the law of the land. So in Sodom, feeding a hungry person was a criminal act that carried the death penalty. This is how far Sodom had descended into absolute separation from anything good and godly. Homosexuality and that perversion was just a symptom of a much greater problem. So today, let's have a look at some lessons we can learn from Sodom and the story in the scriptures. Lesson number one, judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. It may seem that wickedness is prospering for now, but judgment is coming. Several times in the Bible, the city of Sodom and Gomorrah were given as examples of God's judgment on those who reject him and rebel against his lordship. For example, Luke chapter 10, verse 10 and 12 says, When you enter a town and are not welcomed, and then goes on to say, It will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town that doesn't welcome them. Luke chapter 17, verse 28, it was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, did you get that? The day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. I'm telling you, friends, let's not get caught up in series like uh, the, this um, quarter way series, whatever it is, where people are trying to espouse that there would be a seven-year period of repentance, where things would be very bad on earth in you, but you'd have another seven years to repent. Seven years that people would be going around and still talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible doesn't talk about that. That's a lie, I believe, from the pit of hell to try and stay people off. The Bible says it will be like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. The day Sodom left Sodom, the day he was taken out, fire and sulfur rained down and destroyed 
them all. That's how it's going to come. Listen, the rapture's coming soon. I have no doubt about that in my heart. And when Jesus comes again, on that day, that will be the conclusion of what's happening on this planet. That will be the day that the wrath of God is revealed upon this planet. Judgment is coming. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6 says, He condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. Jude 7 says, In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave them up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of, of eternal fire. See, God allowed the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah for a time until judgment came. And when judgment came, it was too late to repent. Oh, friends, God's mercy is long suffering. But I'm telling you here this morning, there will be a day of judgment. And that day of judgment is coming soon. And when that day of judgment comes, there's no second chances or another opportunity to repent or another moment to speak out a prayer of repentance or anything else. When the day comes, that day will end it. Are you ready for when Jesus comes again? The second lesson I think we can learn from the story is that the coming judgment is worse than that even. Jesus told his disciples that the day of judgment would be worse for the people who rejected his message than it was for the day of Sodom and Gomorrah. Again, Matthew 10, if anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake the dust off your feet when you leave that home or town. But I tell you the truth, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. Matthew 11, if the miracles that were performed in you, in Capernaum, he's talking to Capernaum, had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. But I tell you that it would be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. So as bad as the sins of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah were, the Bible says that it'll be worse for us. Why? Because we are more accountable today. We know the full story of God's plan and provision for our salvation. We know that Jesus came and died on a cross for our sins. We know that he's coming again. We know how we can be forgiven and receive eternal life. We know what his word says about caring for the poor and the widow, etc., etc. We know what it says about him creating us male and female. Friends, we are more responsible and we are more accountable because we have his word. And the Sodom story teaches us that the coming judgment is going to be worse than the first. Friends, there's no time to mess around here. We need to make sure that we are doing what the Word calls us to do. We need to make sure that we are accountable, that we are judging ourselves by the Word, that we are not part of that second judgment. The third lesson we can learn from the story of Sodom, I call the modern day slide. It's just like a slippery slope. So how can people steal from the poor? How is it that two days ago the headlines in our local paper in indicated that inmates, prisoners, people who work for government and students were being paid out by the TERS fund, that fund that was set aside to help people who had lost their jobs. Prisoners, students, and people working for government were being paid out. How is it that people can steal from the poor without conscience? How is it, for example, that mass hysteria movements like the BLM sweep People, including Christians, up in its wake when their foundation doctrines are have an overtly anti uh, 
everything that's normal agenda. Go and read it for yourself. Go and, go and Google it and you'll see what I'm saying is true. They, they are set about dismantling, those are their words, dismantling those things that are, are supposed to be normal, like a mother and a father in a home. A strong gay agenda. And yet people are just getting caught up in it. I'll tell you how it happens. The son, Sodom syndrome is upon us. The modern day slide. We're on that, that roller coaster. It just never goes up. Let me read a passage from Romans chapter 1. Chapter 1 from verse 18 to 32 says, The wrath of God is, is being revealed from heaven against all the godliness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. See, we're living in a situation where for some it's as clear as, as, clear as anything. We can see right and wrong. We can see that's good and that's evil. But for most people, it's a blur. For most people, even in the church, for many people, it's as clear as mud. Why? Why can't people see? Why can't people see what's right and what's wrong? I'll tell you why. Because the wrath of God has been revealed from heaven. He's given people over to do things that shouldn't be done. Verse 19 says, since what may be known about God is plain to them. Why? Because God has made it plain to him. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. See, if we can get rid of God, then we bring in evolution then we don't have to be accountable to anybody else and we can just do whatever we like. That's exactly where we find ourselves. Verse 21 says, Although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God or nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. They can't understand anymore. Although they claimed to be wise, oh man, people are so clever. They are so clever. They've got all the answers. They claim to be wise. They became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man, birds and animals and reptiles. Thinking, in their thinking, they, it became futile. Their hearts were darkened. They can't understand anymore. It's as clear as mud. Verse 24, therefore God Listen to these words. they terrifying words. they horrible, frightening words. Therefore God gave them over. God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served creative things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. Did you get that? He gave them over. Like God saying to them, carry on. Do what you want. You don't want me. You do what you want. Verse 26, because of this again, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. You want to know what a natural relation is? Go and have a look at God created them. Male and female, he created them. Adam and Eve, he created them. In the same way, verse 27 says, men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for the perversion. Are you getting the progressive slide into Sodom? We reject God. There's the sexual revolution, this homosexual revolution. And finally, we read about the depraved mind. Verse 28 says, furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. Now, depraved minds means you can't even think straight anymore. That's why people call evil good and good evil. That's why the criminals all get let out as a reward and we've got to jail our houses more and more. 
That's why the politicians who are caught in their, in their deception and lies and all the rest of it just go into silence for a bit and then get promoted somewhere else. Because there's a depraved mind that can't understand anything. They don't understand it. God's given them over. Verse 29 says, They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. Verse 32, although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these things, but they approve of those who practice them. Listen here, there are people in the church today, there are homosexual priests today in the church, there are churches that just cater for transgenders and LGD, whatever it is, Q2+, plus, whatever. We are living in the days of Sodom. We are living in a time that we've been given over to a depraved mind when most people, even those in the church, can no longer see right from wrong. We start by rejecting God. Then we see, and perhaps we can relate this to the 60s, a sexual revolution. In the 70s and 80s and 90s, the homosexual revolution, and even to today. And finally, the situation of a depraved mind. Let me tell you, friends, not even Mrs. Lot will make it. <laughs> Could she look back? You are accountable for yourself. You can't ride on what somebody else has done or somebody else has said. It's about what you are doing. Matthew 24 verse 12 says, Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. He do Jesus doesn't say that the love of some will grow cold. He says the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. Friends, if you're getting onto that slope, I encourage you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, Turn your back on your sin, repent as fast as you can, and get back to your first love, who is Jesus Christ. The story of Sodom teaches us that eventually mankind gets to this place of being given over to a mind that can no longer think straight, and this is where we're at. Clever people taking the Bible, tearing it apart, saying this isn't relevant, that's old-fashioned, I was born this way, or whatever it is. Clever people trying to be clever. And God just laughs. He just gives people over to do what ought not to be done. Beware that slope. Lesson number four and lastly this morning. Lot has a lot to teach us. Lot has a lot <laughs> to teach us. See, it appeared that Lot had allowed himself to be influenced by the inhabitants of Sodom more than he had influenced them. We see in the scripture he originally settled near to Sodom when he parted from Abraham. But by the time of the story, he's actually living in Sodom. And we see when he tried to deter his guests uh, or protect his, rather, deter the, the attackers on his guests or protect his guests, he was severely threatened by his attackers. And as we attempt to influence our world for Christ, See, we can't allow the temptations of the world to corrupt us like perhaps it had happened to Lot. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says, Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. If we dabble with sin, we are often pulled into it a little at a time without noticing until we are fully involved. And perhaps that's what had happened to Lot. Even though the Bible tells us he was a righteous man, he starts on the outskirts of Sodom, just seeing sin from a distance. And then he kind of got closer and closer and eventually lands right there in the midst of wickedness. What happens is often when we begin to compromise our beliefs, it becomes much more difficult to start to get back to where we should be. That little bit of compromise becomes a bigger compromise and a bigger one and a bigger one. And when that happens publicly, ha, people don't take us seriously anymore. 
2 Corinthians 6 says, Don't be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Chapter 7, verse 1 says, Since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. So Lot teaches us a lot this morning. Teaches us not to flirt with sin, not to come close to it, to avoid it at all costs, not to put yourself out there because it doesn't work. What are you watching? What are you reading? What are you spending your time thinking about? Because if I just begin to flirt with that, it's going to take me down like the people of Sodom. Well, friends, the lessons this morning, I think, have been clear. The story of Sodom and I think Sodom and Gomorrah, Gomorrah I think, is clear. To summarize, number one, judgment is coming. Are you ready to meet the Savior? You see, judgment is coming and it's going to be worse than the first judgment because we are more accountable because we have the word, we have the truth, and we've done nothing about it. Beware of that judgment. Thirdly, we learned that the modern day slide is happening. Just make sure you're not on it. Get off it as quickly as you can. Oh, the but number of people I've seen that started in the faith and have ended up in the gutter because they've allowed themselves to be influenced. That it seems that their minds have become depraved. They can't even think straight anymore. They get so clever in their ivory, t- ivory towers of knowledge and, and all the rest of it, and they end up in the gutter. Just beware of that depraved mind. And lastly, Lot has got a lot to teach us. Don't flirt with sin. It's not worth it. Get back to your first love. His name is Jesus. Purify yourself, as the Bible tells, according to the Bible. Not according to what people say, according to what the Bible says. And let's see this thing together in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's coming soon, friends. He's coming soon. Let us pray together. Our Father, we thank you for this time of sharing around the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. I thank you for these lessons that you have shown us. And Lord, I pray for everyone watching right now, where the enemy would be coming and whispering all sorts of things in their heads. Lord, I thank you that we have your word, that we don't have to argue, we don't have to debate. Uh, Lord, I know that when we stand for truth, it's, it's not an easy thing sometimes. And I know that many families are dealing with many different issues. I know perhaps there are more questions that are being raised than answers given. But I thank you for your spirit who is truth, who is comforter, who is counselor. That he will lead us and guide us into all truth. That we will know what to say, what to do, how to respond, how to react. Even to those nearest and dearest to us. I thank you. Lord, I thank you for your truth. And I thank you for your kindness in allowing us to hear it this morning and to take it inside and to chew it on, chew on it, that it becomes part of who we are. In Jesus' name, we give you praise. Amen. Thanks so much for joining with us again this morning. And God willing, we'll see you next week. We're going to talk about the story of Hagar and Ishmael. Bye-bye.